We are here tonight with Rafe Baggio, entrepreneur and TV presenter at the TG Foundation Scholar Dinner in aid of victims of sexual violence in the Congo. Rafe, thank you so much for coming tonight. Thank you ever so much uh, for inviting me to such a worthwhile event. Um, you've spent a good deal of time in Africa, first working with a charity in Ethiopia and also through your business ventures working to get home HIV testing kits distributed around the continent. What have you learned from these experiences? Well, uh, very good question. Um, firstly, I started my love affair, if I can call it that, with Africa at a very young age. My father was exceptionally itinerant, more so than I think the average father. Um, and we started travelling mostly to the west, so it started off as Gambia and then it stretched out to Senegal, it's more central Burkina Faso. Um, and in fact, funny enough, those became the countries that I focused on where my HIV test um, kicked into action. I wanted to bring the product to the UK. The Department of Health, uh, for various reasons, thought that it was uh, not a great product to have on the shelves of pharmacies, just in case people who were to find in the convenience of their own home that they were HIV decided to inflict harm on them. So I set to work taking the product to a place that, as we know, is ravaged by HIV. Ravaged in, in, in quite a different way to the way it's ravaged in, in, the, in, in the West. And that is um, shown through the, the vast numbers of people who have it and don't know that they've got it and as a result pass it on. So we started off in Gambia. That, again, uh, took us to Senegal. And then we went off east to Mozambique, southern east to Mozambique, and then South Africa. Um, and as I, you know, as I expanded this um, company of mine, I, I just fell more and more in love with Africa. It wasn't just falling in love with it, though. It was also understanding that, as a continent, it's incredibly misunderstood. And by that I mean it's so often referred to by a lot of our, um, I should say, philanthropists, who do it, obviously, uh, you know, through, through no will, um, but they occasionally refer it to... Uh, almost as a, as a super country, as though the lines that delineate one country to the other don't exist, as though every single country in Africa is similar. Um, and perhaps in many ways they are, but um, yeah, I was interested about how, in fact, each country is, um, is so, so vastly different to the country that borders borders it and uh, contingent contingent with its borders um, and I um, yeah and I, I fell in love with that and I um, and I still to this day remain quite close to it and when did you first learn of the crisis of sexual violence in the DRC well I have to say it was um, it was someone who worked for the TG foundation um, that really um, kind of uh, I should say educated me with regards the the horrificness that goes on in the Democratic Republic of the Congo. Um, it is a country with a very, very uh, unstable, shall we say, history. Um, it's gone through numbers of name changes, it's gone through a vast, uh, some would say, pitiful political history. And that, I think, is very much represented in its current form. It's very unstable, it's, it's politically as unstable as I think you know, any country could possibly be. And, um, you know, the, the, the rape that seems to be endemic um, appears to me to be a different type of rape that goes on, for instance, in England, insofar as, of course, rape is rape, and there is absolutely uh, n no way that one can differentiate between different types of rape, but the rape that seems to go on there is very much inbuilt into the culture. In other words, the rape that goes on there seems to be acceptable. Um, if someone rapes in England, they, generally speaking, know that it's A, against the law, and B, wrong. The rape that goes on in the Democratic Republic of the Congo um, is different, as I say, insofar as it doesn't appear to be either A, morally wrong, or B, against the law. Not against the law, because there is very little law there. Um, so that was a real eye-opener, the fact that something that we in the West take to be morally reprehensible, the... Uh, the, the, the rape of another human being could be so accepted, uh, not just accepted, but also could be seen to be in so pitiful a way, a, a means of, uh, in some cases with soldiers fighting, um, a patriotic act that, that somehow could be seen to be benefiting the country. I mean, it's that kind of mindset we're dealing with, uh, which is um, 
you know, which is just quite frankly from another another universe. It's very difficult to comprehend and fathom. Um, and what responsibility do you think companies have to make sure that their work is not funding violence? Well, I think corporate responsibility now. So I think companies are very much going as far as they possibly can, or they're not not far enough, as far as I'm concerned, um, to ensure that the business that they conduct is not just profitable in terms of finance, but is also, if I can put it in this slightly cliche fashion, is also profitable where morality is concerned. In other words, they're not just making a quick buck, but they're also making sure that those that are involved in the success of their company, be it domestically or internationally, are also benefiting. If not benefiting, then at least not being harmed. Um, and I think that's vitally important. It's a terrific step in the right direction, but a hell of a lot needs to do uh, needs to take place to make that far more widespread. And, and like I say, there's a, a lot more room for manoeuvre for companies to do far, far better. Um, so, yeah, uh, I think moral, uh, moral, moral corporate responsibility is absolutely essential. Absolutely. And what measures do you think need to be put in place to regulate the supply chain for conflict minerals that fund the violence in Congo? The regular, well, the Democratic Republic of the Congo is obviously incredibly uh, rich in certain minerals. I mean, we have this in, in, you know, in, in a lot of African countries, uh, tainted with the blood of those that attempt to extract them uh, to the disbenefit of the indigenous people. Um, I mean, like I said before, the, the, the country is politically unstable. If, if we want to see far-reaching benefits, we need to make sure that a politics is inserted into the country that widens its tentacles and make sure that the other things that generally come hand in hand with good politics are in place. Um, so I think, I mean, it could be very much a case of putting the cart before the horse. Before I think we, we ensure that certain um, good moral acts take place, we need to make sure that the country you know, has a democracy. I mean, is it not ironic that the country is called the Democratic Republic of the Congo? I mean, it's 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 an obscenity to call it that. Um, it's pitiful. It, it it it's it's not at all democratic. And and I think if we bring that into the um, into the fore, if you like, then I think we can start. You know, we can start kicking into action the other things, and that would be the regulation um, of how certain minerals um, and certain metals. Are extracted. Um, so I think first and foremost, you know, let's as a country, let's as a um, um, you know as a collective body, put pressure on our government to ensure that more is done in these countries that we seem to have so little interest in because they don't directly affect us. Uh, I mean, you know, take for instance, you know, the Zimbabwe and Mugabe regime. I mean, it, you know, that in itself is is disgusting that the man is even in power. Um, now we can you know, talk about that, but we won't, but essentially what I'm saying is let's create a political climate where things that we take for granted can be created, and that, you know, among many other things, would include the correct regulation of um, their, their resources, which uh, they should benefit from. Yes, absolutely. And what role can consumers play in putting pressure on business leaders to be more conscious of these issues? As consumers, um, I mean, it, you know, it's always funny because as consumers we in fact have a huge amount of power, consumer power. We never seem to execute that power. The best way, obviously, to execute your power as a consumer is not to buy. Um, if you know of a product that, for instance, uses sweatshops and child labour, to make the, the dress or the jackets you wear, what do you do? Well, you don't buy it, but you don't just stop there. You also try and put pressure on that company to change its corporate mentality. Um, you try and put pressure on that company to do the right thing. Um, and if that doesn't work, then you take it to a higher level and you, uh, you put pressure on your government to, to make sure that some type of embargo takes place between your nation and that company. I mean, if we found out, for instance, that one of our beloved uh, designer superstores was making 
clothing in the most reprehensible way, um, we would, you know, I think, I hope, stop buying from them, and uh, that in itself would lead the company to change its its mentality. So I, I, I think, I mean, you know, they want to make money, obviously, so sometimes you don't even need to take it as far as government pressure, just simply not buy, purchasing and not buying. I mean, you need to be an ethical consumer, in other words. Okay, great. And um, would you ever travel to the DRC, and what message would you bring to the population there? Uh, I certainly would travel travel to the Democratic Republic of the Congo. In fact, I'm, in, in a way, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of shocked because I haven't been there already. Um, I speak French, and I think I guess it would be a perfect example to uh, practice that French, obviously in a different type of uh, patois. But um, what message would I send to the people? Would, well, the, the the message I would send to the people is, I mean, well, firstly, the message to the women would be that. Um, they should not in any way look at themselves as second-class citizens, that in fact they certainly have um, a lot more power than they may have been led to believe, um, you know, call it, call it the, uh, the, the sisterhood of the world, if you like. Um, and to the men, um, I mean, I, you know, look, I had this when I was expanding the company for HIV. I was having to deal at the time with the mentality, for instance, if you remember, Zuma, um, who, who used to say some of the most ridiculous things, like if you want to treat HIV, then you could rub your genitalia in beetroot juice. I mean, we're talking about that ridiculous mentality. Now, Africa, parts of Africa have a very tribal mentality. It's very difficult as a Westerner to go in there and try and change that. You know, these tribal mentalities have been in place for a long, long time, sometimes centuries. Um, so you've got to start from the grassroots, and the grassroots, as far as I'm concerned, is education. Um, education, you know, is vitally important. Um, so whether that's setting up schools, whether that's setting up classes for information to be disseminated, um, it's very much a from the ground initiative. Education, education, education. If, you know, I, I really don't want to sound like Tony Blair, but in this case, it absolutely is the way forward. Um, and I think once you educate the women. Once you educate the men, that will go, I think, you know, some way to changing the mentality. You're not just going to change it by going there and saying that what you do is wrong. You need to explain why it's wrong, and you need to explain um, rather swiftly. And, you know, this can unfortunately only come about if a good political and legal system is in place that if you do what you do, um, you will be seriously reprimanded and you will be seriously uh, looked, looked down and, and punished. So, like I say, a political system with the rule of law that we're used to in this country needs to be um, assembled and, um, and created. Um, but I think what I, the message I would send is um, uh, that, as, as a fellow human being, you know, to the men especially, um, women are on an equal level to them, and uh, what they do is, in fact, completely and utterly um, despicable. And, uh, that I have no doubt that they know what they're doing is wrong. I mean, you, you, you know, they, they absolutely know. Um, in fact, it was very interesting on the um, TG Foundation website when soldiers were being interviewed um, and they were saying, you know, they'd raped 15 or 20 women, sometimes more, when the question was posed, if somebody were to rape your sister and mother, how would you feel? And, and of course, the double standard showed um, it was suddenly unacceptable. So they know. I mean, they know. Uh, this isn't, you know, this isn't a case of trying to guess whether or not we're dealing with a um, different species of human being that has a different mentality. They know what they're doing is wrong. Um, so it's time to drum it into them even more, and uh, like I say, try and uh, describe the consequences of uh, what they do. Okay, Ray. Thank you so much for speaking to us. It's been really interesting. Thank, thank you. you very much. Thank you so much for uh, inviting me, and um, you know, good luck with the uh, with the crusade.